Sadly, after the Easter attacks, um, there is a certain level of tension and perhaps misunderstanding between the Sinhalese community and the Muslim community. If you could contribute towards building uh, unity within Sri Lanka, what would you do? The unity will have to be achieved um, while you respect diversity. You see, uh, you cannot have overall unity uh, in a diverse society unless you are able to recognize their individual identity, small um, cult which was created by uh, certain forces, both from within and outside. And we had a lot of um, uh, mystery relating to this has now come out into the open. And we could see that the government is now struggling to justify matters and then trying to, you know, hide certain things. And also doesn't seem to understand uh, this nuance, I mean, they keep talking about one country, one law, right. um, forgetting the fact that you need to respect diversity. Welcome everyone, you're watching Conversations with Alanki and today I'm happy to be in conversation with the leader of the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress, Member of Parliament, Honorable Rauf Hakim. Thank you so much for um, taking time off your busy schedule because I know you don't usually face many interviews, so it is a privilege to have this discussion with you. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you, Alanki. It's a pleasure. Um, firstly, I'd like to know, um, Sri Lanka Muslim Congress is one of the political parties representing the Muslim community in Sri Lanka, and you're the leader of the party. Um, what do you feel you have been able to contribute towards the Muslim community in Sri Lanka during your tenure? Well, uh, Sri Lanka Muslim Congress as a political party uh, is perhaps the predominant party which uh, uh, came up in the mid-80s uh, uh, when my uh, late leader, Mr. M. H. M. Ashraf, formed it um, in the backdrop of uh, a very tumultuous period uh -huh. in Sri Lanka's political history uh, when uh, the ethnic problem was at its peak. Uh, violence had just started to have its uh, serious impact on all communities. Uh, and those uh, forces, particularly uh, in the Tamil spectrum, when they sought to uh, achieve their political objectives through violence, the emergence of the SLMC uh, became uh, a conduit uh, for young Muslims and others who may have otherwise uh, resorted to violence themselves mm -hmm. because Muslims were also Tamil speaking and they also had uh, similar grievances uh, in the Northeast uh, in particular. So, uh, Mr. Ashraf's visionary uh, uh, political ideology uh, based on Islam and uh, uh, accepted by the people of the area subsequently also spread to other parts of the country uh, since uh, the Provincial Council elections in 1988, the first uh, round of Provincial Council elections. The Sri Lanka Freedom Party, uh, being a national party, boycotted the elections and several other parties, including mm -hmm. the JVP, which was uh, by that time was underground and was banned. Uh, so, uh, when we came into active politics in 1988, uh, both uh, the Sri Lanka Freedom Party and the JVP uh, were not participating in the elections. Mm -hmm. uh, and Muslims uh, had an alternate uh, force uh, to vote uh, as against the United National Party. And that's the uh, initial period in which uh, uh, this party gained its um, uh, traction with the people. So, um, the need for uh, the identity politics at the time was quite... Uh, pronounced because of um, the refusal by the state to recognize the grievances of uh, Tamil-speaking minorities. So, um, uh, it doesn't mean that we didn't have uh, any common ground uh, with uh, other Tamil parties, mm -hmm. but unfortunately Tamil militancy uh, at one point uh, went against the Muslims uh, in a very violent way, murdering Muslims, um, in not simply in their houses and uh, paddy fields, but even in mosques while they were at prayer. 
So there were large scale atrocities against uh, Muslims by uh, several Tamil militant organizations and subsequently LTT was uh, targeting Muslims in such severe fashion. Uh, so much so that uh, the entire uh, Muslim population from the north were um, ethnically cleansed uh, due to their violence. So they happened to be the first Muslims perhaps uh, anywhere in the world to have been totally ethnically uh, driven away uh, by uh, militant force, uh, even before it happened in other areas. You know, we now hear about uh, Myanmar and various other places, mm -hmm. uh, and even in um, uh, several other parts of the Muslim world. So Muslims in Sri Lanka has almost uh, uh, for 30 years have had to uh, endure this type of um, atrocities. And then um, we also had a, a space which we used to uh, win over the rights that were being um, trampled upon by the uh, nationalist forces. So on both fronts, both on the Tamil nationalist side and on the single nationalist side, we had um, our um, uh, so-called political uh, opponents mm -hmm. uh, uh, who had always been criticizing us. But then uh, gradually uh, we became a, a predominant force uh, which, were, which was ultimately a, a primary spokesman for the grievances of Muslims. Would you say that the Sri Lanka Muslim Congress particularly represents the Muslim community in Sri Lanka because the needs of the Muslims in this country are unmet? Yes, it was. And that is why uh, this came about, as I told you, the period uh, of the Indo-Lanka Accord, yes. um, uh, which uh, was ushered in uh, by the J.R. Jawadan administration then, um, under pressure by the Indian government, of course, because of um, uh, the government's attitude uh, to uh, Tamil demands. Uh, Tamil militant organizations uh, seeking to achieve their objectives through uh, violence mm -hmm. meant that state responded uh, in similar fashion. And uh, that finally prompted the Indian government to intervene on behalf of uh, the uh, Tamil community, which uh, uh, had a massive uh, sympathy uh, uh, in the uh, southern state of Tamil Nadu, which has almost uh, uh, 70 million uh, Tamil population now. Mm -hmm. So naturally, the Indian government uh, was uh, felt the pressure and had to uh, almost intervene militarily and to prevent that uh, finally uh, Mr. J. R. Jawadan had to cave in uh, with uh, the Indo Lanka Accord uh, which again was a issue which had much to do with geopolitics than uh, other uh, matters so it was a miscalculation of the geopolitical importance of uh, this region uh, and the way in which we handled uh, our neighbor's concerns uh, mm -hmm. in a very lopsided manner without giving due regard to um, legitimate uh, issues that came up. Uh, this resulted in, uh, in a situation where the militant organizations received a safe haven uh, in Tamil Nadu for their activities and they were able to carry on uh, uh, their uh, training and various other activities uh, mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, you know, the Indian uh, government also looking away to a certain extent because of um, the type of uh, sympathy they have had in the uh, territory of Tamil Nadu. So this is a well-known fact. So uh, because of which uh, finally uh, uh, the Indulanka Accord came about and there are a serious uh, injustice was uh, uh, done to the Muslims because the Muslims in the uh, northeast uh, and particularly in the eastern province uh, okay. constitute a considerable number and uh, their political power was weakened by the um, uh, forced amalgamation of the north and the east. By the Indalanka Accord there was this so-called temporary merger 
which resulted in the political power of the Muslims being weakened overnight. And this, um, despite uh, uh, interventions by the then uh, Muslim members of parliament uh, who belonged to the United National Party, uh, was totally uh, overlooked and ignored uh, by Mr. Jaya Jawadana and also by the Indian government. So um, this resulted in the need for Muslims to have their own identity uh, properly uh, brought up in uh, national politics and to also fight against uh, the ill effects of the uh, forced uh, uh, merger of the North and the East, which was then supposed to be temporary, mm -hmm. but the referendum never came about. So that resulted in the marginalization of the Muslim political power. And that is why the emergence of the SLNC was um, so strongly felt. And that reception by the Muslims uh, towards the SLMC was so pronounced that we were able to uh, dominate uh, elections in the Northeast Provincial Councils when it was first held. So we ultimately had 17 seats uh, in uh, that uh, temporarily merged Northeast Province mm -hmm. and emerged as the main opposition in that council. If there's anything you could accomplish as a leader of the Muslims, uh, anything that could contribute towards the Muslim community, what would it be? Well, the, in every front, uh, the community has its own uh, issues and uh, grievances, uh, particularly this being a country which uh, has had uh, um, adult franchise for ever since 1931. Uh, you know, uh, Muslims have had their fair share of representation uh, in uh, legislative uh, bodies, particularly in parliament. Um, so, you know, we have always kept our faith in democracy and never resorted to violence as a means to achieve our political objectives. Mm -hmm. So what uh, we have always been agitating for is to have uh, a level playing field for all communities, I mean, not just the Muslims alone. You now we have the upcountry Tamils and the Muslims who um, number uh, uh, quite a uh, you know, specific uh, you know, crowd is there in every uh, province. And then we have a, a certain leverage. You mm -hmm. see, we have to use that leverage to see that um, no discriminatory policy impacts on on. Uh, our progress. You know, there are, uh, you know, without, uh, though in the, uh, in the uh, outer appearance, it might seem as if there is no discrimination uh, towards the minority, but in the, its implementation, we find whether it's land policy, whether it's education policy, or whether it's in, um, you know, health issues, there are, there are variety of other, you know, uh, political considerations come in. And then these issues get overlooked. So it is up to us to bring it to uh, focus um, at the peripheral level, at the national level, and then to have uh, solutions um, uh, found for them. And that is what we have been doing throughout our uh, history. All right, moving on to a different question. You are openly vocal about the fact that you do not support the 20th Amendment to the Constitution, mm. yet several members of your party uh, voted in favor of the 20th Amendment. Do you think that your party stands undivided? No, it's a very um, um, awkward question for me throughout. I mean, this has been the biggest problem uh, of late for the party. Uh, we have had this kind of uh, renegade members um, um, going against the will of the party uh, and its leadership. Uh, it is, you know, I have also been criticized for um, weakness in my leadership, and not uh, being able to uh, keep them on line and on tow with the, uh, um, the party's uh, position on this. Unfortunately, uh, you know, those other members who belong to particularly the eastern province, um, because of their uh, political dominance or, or the party's uh, uh, interest, and they seem to interpret as if, you know, they uh, simply will have to 
um, go along with the ruling party in, uh, in trying to achieve uh, developmental objectives. This is a very short-sighted view in my opinion. Uh, we need to also look at the overall impact for the country mm -hmm. and also for the community in um, vesting untrammeled power in uh, the executive presidency um, and also with um, the two-third, uh, almost two-third majority mm -hmm. that the um, current administration has gained. They only needed a few votes. Uh, naturally, we were a target because we were a small party and um, members always can be inveigled uh, with all types of promises to uh, vote with the government. So, um, uh, it's a very embarrassing situation uh, for the party and its leadership. But however, I'm confident uh, that the party's rank and file uh, will not uh, um, um, side with them when it comes to an election. But I have made it very, very clear to them that uh, the uh, uh, rank and file of the party do not endorse uh, uh, this attitude of theirs. Uh, you know, they seem to think uh, development and uh, power politics that they want to um, uh, engage in, uh, forgetting the fact that the community um, grievances on very emotional and sentimental issues, such as, for instance, the forced burial or forced cremation mm -hmm. of Muslim uh, uh, bodies uh, due to COVID death, was a very, very um, serious issue regarding which this government saw uh, continued uh, uh, draconian policy, uh, deliberately aimed at uh, uh, hurting the Muslim community's sentiments not based on any science. Mm -hmm. And this was finally um, uh, proven that uh, the government uh, had uh, continued this despite the fact... Uh, uh, that the World parts. Health Organization yeah, itself. WHO was very, very specific on that issue. But then so-called, uh, you know, uh, experts they have uh, appointed to... Uh, promulgate this policy uh, were hell-bent on a very racist uh, reasoning to, you know, couched in, you know, propaganda of uh, uh, demonizing and stigmatizing a community. So, um, finally, it came a proper with the Geneva Resolution also embodying this because of uh, international lobbying that we were able to do as a community. And we succeeded in finally having it reversed and that's... Uh, uh, something that um, this government must bear in mind that it is uh, never going to benefit them to continuously ignore international opinion uh, on such um, baseless uh, racist uh, attitudes. And sadly, after the Easter attacks, um, there is a certain level of tension and perhaps misunderstanding between the Sinhalese community and the Muslim community. But it's very important that irrespective of race and religion, everyone is a Sri Lankan first. And to do that, you have to be able to coexist peacefully and to respect one another. If you could contribute towards building um, uh, unity within Sri Lanka, what would you do? And yes. how would you go about it? The unity will have to be achieved um, uh, while you respect diversity. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, you cannot have overall unity uh, in a diverse society unless you are able to recognize, uh, recognize their individual identity mm -hmm. uh, and to um, uh, consider the necessary dignity to be afforded to each of those sections of the people. Right. And that is where we don't seem to be understanding the need uh, for the value of um, having to have an inclusive society. You see, uh, unity doesn't mean you, you uh, force it down the throat of everybody, forgetting that they, they have their own individual identities. But in, in, in trying to work towards a Sri Lankan common identity, we need to also respect the cultural differences and uh, I mean, if you look at the society today, um, the school system and various other things, unfortunately, people don't seem to uh, realize that um, 
uh, a certain um, amount of um, uh, polarization that had taken place as a result of the, the colonial masters in the past um, uh, were a, a historic thing which, it, which had its own uh, antecedents mm -hmm. uh, based on the way in which uh, the colonial masters um, managed to, uh, to maintain uh, the balance between uh, communities and uh, didn't want to allow uh, uh, unnecessary domination of one sector or the other. The, with the independence, you know, the problem started with uh, uh, when the, the singular Buddhist majority felt that they were wronged while uh, uh, the, the, the colonial um, elite and the, uh, and the bourgeois of the um, minority communities were gaining uh, mm -hmm. at the expense of the, uh, the singular majority. That mindset resulted in uh, unnecessarily uh, targeting and disenfranchising uh, the Indian Tamil uh, community initially and subsequently the Sinhala only uh, legislation and various mm -hmm. other uh, faulty legislation led to um, grievances being uh, so sharpened and um, the cleavages became uh, so pronounced uh, that uh, some of these groups started to resort to violence. But as for the Muslim community, which it, it had always remained in the mainstream and never wanted to resort to violence as a means, means to achieve political objectives. So the emergence of the SLMC was also in the background, as I explained to you, uh, of the Indo Lanka Accord, which was forced upon the community. And uh, when the terms of that agreement deprived the Muslims of their um, rightful share in power mm -hmm. in the so-called combined northeast. You see, there was no other alternative but for them to form themselves into a pretend political force. And um, so that's for the initial beginning of it. And uh, continuously, and particularly this regime also doesn't seem to understand uh, this nuance. I mean, they keep talking about one country, one law, right. um, forgetting the fact that you need to respect diversity, mm -hmm. uh, even within the singular community, even within the other faith communities. Uh, you have their own um, uh, identity issues and that needs to be respected. Now, if you look at the uh, port city legislation they are bringing, that's in fact one country, one law, and the one country, two laws. Mm -hmm. You see, that is what the government is going to implement. But that doesn't mean uh, so the, the personal, in personal dealings of each uh, community matters, particularly marriage and divorce um, uh, and inheritance and various other issues. Um, each community has its own uh, system of law and that uh, has been uh, properly recognized uh, for centuries in this country. So, so therefore, uh, this type of uh, very narrow, um, unnecessary focus on very trivial issues of nature, forgetting the fact uh, that um, you are only feeding in uh, to radicalization. You are only creating a, a fertile ground for radicalization by uh, trying to grab uh, the rights of a community which they have for centuries enjoyed. You see, So uh, that is where things have gone wrong. But I am sure in uh, time to come with proper understanding, proper dialogue, these issues can be resolved. Moving on to a very uh, different question, something that is not related to what we were uh, discussing about. Do you feel that, I mean, many are disappointed with the fact that several politicians, not all, but a handful of them, do not conduct themselves professionally, especially in parliament. What criteria do you think um, an ideal politician should possess? Or what criteria do you think an ideal politician should meet? No, you know, they, any politician as a public figure needs to be accountable uh -huh. uh, to their voters. See, accountability matters. Accountability means uh, decorum in the house uh -huh. and also um, articulating your point of view 
in a decent and acceptable manner. Right. Unfortunately, what happens is in, a, in the rough and tumble of politics, some of these people forget the basic uh, decency of debate. You see? And then they tend to behave uh, in a very rowdy fashion. Uh -huh. Right. You see, and that's what happens. I mean, even this morning in Parliament, on a solemn occasion when we have to um, uh, mark the second anniversary of this um, uh, terrible uh, Easter Sunday attack, um, you saw how uh, you know uh, some of the members behaved in 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 trying to justify uh, or rather. Uh, point a finger at the other side, but they don't realize is that this is a national issue which has to be tackled uh, together uh, with the opposition uh, and the government coming together and understanding the uh, the nature of uh, uh, this uh, serious uh, tragedy that we all faced, and particularly for the Muslim community, and though the the Christians uh, Christian community were the initial, uh, you know, they, they had to face this uh, atrocity. Um, finally, it's the Muslim community itself which has become the victims today because um, of the attitude of the government in trying to um, use this to achieve uh, a shortcut to power. And that is what they did. They used uh, some of the electronic media, uh, which was having a very racist policy. Um, trying to uh, focus blame on the entire community, whereas this was just a small um, uh, cult which was created by uh, certain forces, both from within and outside. And we had a lot of um, uh, mystery relating to this has now come out into the open and we could see that the government is now struggling to justify matters and, and trying to, you know, hide certain things. But um, they cannot do this forever. Uh, certain truths have to come out. And in politics, it's very important that there is always a strong opposition. Do you believe that the UNP and the Samagi Janabalavegya should unite to form a stronger opposition? The United National Party has virtually become a rump of its old self unfortunately because of the adamance of uh, uh, its former leadership. Uh, but subsequently, it so happened that the so-called Samagi Jana Balavegya, uh, which was created uh, with all of us cooperating, even the other minor parties and minority parties, together we backed uh, uh, Mr. Sajid Premadaz's leadership. And we were able to, um, you know, virtually uh, you know, having a party which was formed uh, just on the eve of the elections, um, finally uh, grabbed all the seats in the opposition, um, uh, other than the uh, other smaller parties, uh, the TNA and the JVP and the rest. Mm -hmm. You see, so we became the predominant force uh, in the opposition. Um, of course, um, in having lost the presidential elections, uh, it was obvious that uh, the United National Party should have had a little bit of mature approach to look at the internal convulsions within the party for a, uh, for a paradigm change in its uh, uh, political leadership. Um, intransigence uh, relating to that resulted in this uh, uh, predicament. But of course, as I told you, as you uh, in mentioned, uh, it is imperative for uh, the opposition to have uh, uh, some unity and particularly the United National Party uh, should not, uh, uh, should look at the reality, the ground reality and um, try and uh, uh, get into the Samagi Jana Balavegi fold mm -hmm. rather than to be the reverse uh, to happen. That's um, uh, that's a bit of a pipe dream, in my opinion, because uh, they have become a virtual rump, whereas the SJB has become the predominant force. Mm -hmm. So um, now it's up to the uh, SJB to call the shots and not the United National Party. Uh, moving on to the final question. Um, when you look back on your journey as a politician, what do you think has been the biggest challenge you've had to face so far? Challenges are manifold. 
my main challenge initially was when my late leader uh, suddenly died in a helicopter accident during the election campaign. Uh, I was a young lieutenant uh, in a, um, a party which suddenly lost its founder leader. So, um, the initial pangs of leadership and the difficulties in shouldering heavy mm -hmm. responsibilities was immense. Uh, but I, I was equal to the task. I was able to rely on the legacy of my late leader. Uh, who, he was a towering figure. He was a uh, man who achieved uh, much within a very short period. Uh, people will be surprised that it was merely six years in opposition and six years in government uh, that Mr. Ashraf was able to leave uh, such a large uh, uh, legacy for all of us to follow. And uh, I'm glad that uh, I was able to take forward uh, uh, his uh, political ideology and um, uh, be a political force that had uh, substantial leverage in national politics. And in re regional politics, we have even larger leverage. So, um, uh, so those initial challenges were the most uh, tough uh, uh, ones for me. Um, subsequently, we faced uh, several other um, defections and difficulties, uh, which we have coped uh, quite, uh, um, I mean, uh, to the best of our ability in trying to remain the predominant uh, uh, Muslim political party uh, in this country. I'm sure your journey in politics would have been a challenging one, not just for you, but for many politicians, as I feel politics is, uh, is, is quite uh, a challenging career. Um, it was really nice to have had this conversation with you. I truly enjoyed it. And thank you for making the time. And uh, uh, we have come to the end of the conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed this conversation. I will be back soon with another episode. Until then, take care and stay safe. And thank you very much, Mr. Hakim. Thank you very much, Alanki, for those probing questions. Thanks a lot.